knowing what you value, I think, is probably the most critical and under-realized foundation to success and to happiness, honestly, because... Born in 92 on the block with the sharks Come from a different cloth, y'all would get ripped apart You want a diamond, then you gotta get it in the dark We dropping nuggets like Carmelo went to rock a bar Now we eating from state to state, we scrape the plate I put my eggs in a basket, took a leap of faith I took a chance, now we grow and see the impact Decoding success with special guests, now let's bring Matt Welcome to the Decoding Success Podcast. Excited to have you here. If it is your first time listening to the show, I want to welcome you in. If you are a returning member of our incredible community that has been built over the last six years, helping us getting to top 1% in the world, I want to thank you and welcome you back in here too. We have an incredible guest sitting next to me. Before introducing him, I just want to express the gratitude that I have in my heart for you tuning into the show because you could be doing anything else in the world. You could be listening to one of the other 7 million podcasts, 300,000 plus active podcasts. You could be scrolling the good old TikTok or Instagram. You could be doing literally anything, but you chose this particular episode, this particular podcast for a reason. And maybe it was divine guidance. Maybe it was just the luck of the draw, but you are here. So I'm calling you to open your heart, open your mind to what is to be discovered in this episode today. Now, the gentleman sitting next to me, the 10th person to walk around the world. I almost said the 10th wonder of the world. <laughs> the 10th person to walk around the world, transformational keynote speaker who elevates individuals by demonstrating the power of value-driven action, audacious goal setting, and embracing constraints to drive growth and unlock the solutions needed to forge your path forward. Today, we are joined by Tom Tursich. Well Tom, pronounced. did I get it right? Well I got it right. There we go, <laughs> yeah. man. Listen, thank you so much for hopping on this. I'm so excited to dive in with you. Um, super grateful for you being here, traveling all over the place, and you you landed here in New York, so thank you so much. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, happy to be here. Looking forward to it. How are you, man? I'm doing good, yeah. I have uh, you know, my book coming out in, in a month and a half, and since the walk ended, that has been my daily grind, eight hours, 10 hours a day, and I handed it off to the publisher, the final draft, Maybe a month ago, something like that, and now I have a ton of time, and so I'm doing podcasts. And, I love to hear and that publicity and chatting and uh, traveling around. Well, we're going to do a whole lot of that today. In fact, I actually heard you literally right before I left my house to come here. I heard you in an interview. You were asked the question. I believe it was when you just got back to your hometown, right? You walk, what, what what bridge did you walk over to get back home? The Ben Franklin. The Ben Franklin, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you walk over the Ben Franklin, and I believe you were asked something along the lines of. Do you feel you're a good writer? And if not, like whatever it was, looking back on that moment to where you are today, do you feel like your writing has become to the standard or the level that you want it to be? So I don't remember that question. That's interesting. I feel like that's, uh, yeah, I wonder who asked me that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I do think I'm a good writer, which is I think surprising because yeah. I have this conversation with my mom a lot, who's an artist and she illustrated this children's book that we did and she's been a toy designer forever. But with photography, which is something that kind of grew out of the walk mm. where I was traveling and it was just like one of the few hobbies you could have while walking was photography. And I wasn't interested in it initially, but gradually I'm just taking photos every day, get mm -hmm. more interested. And eventually like you come to understand that you know, the real world doesn't translate to a photograph. You just have to take a photograph as a piece of art. Mm. And but you can grasp the whole thing at once. You can look at a photograph and kind of know what it needs, what you should have done differently, how the colors might work a little better. But with writing, you can't grasp the whole thing all at once. Yeah. You know, a book is just so massive that you read it sentence by sentence and you can hold some threads in your head at once that you're trying to carry through. But you can't look at it like a photograph or like a painting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you think you're a good writer, you hope that you're a good writer, but you really don't know until other people read it and yeah. they say, oh, yeah, this is good. And uh, I'm, just lately, I'm getting a, a few blurbs, a few reviews in from other authors and they're 
glowing. So um, my confidence is building. <laughs> there you go. I love yeah. to hear that, man. When you were on the walk, were you do like I know the photography aspect of it, but like, were you doing any journaling? Yeah, I journaled all the time. Yeah, I have five or six journals packed full. Yeah, and the journaling was much more detailed in the beginning when it was new, and every day was just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. That then I was journaling I mean, two pages at a time. But as the walk went on, it eventually became more just like normal life. And yeah. so the journals became simpler. And the details, you know, that I included initially just weren't as necessary. They were kind of given at yeah. that point. Yeah. But I have a ton of journals and for the writing for the book, it was really fun to go back and dig through them. And you of course remember certain things but then it's not until you're looking at the journal and you're looking through these specific days where it's not nothing really profound happened mm -hmm. but it sparks some moment or some place and it was cool to kind of relive that and highlight the moments where sure. i thought oh this is interesting i can thread this into my growth yeah. yeah when you were journaling while walking i'm curious like was the intention for it to like log what you were doing or was it more so to be the outlet you needed for expression in those overwhelming times maybe both uh, more log for sure yeah. yeah i definitely did not feel it as a need to like express myself yeah. in a way and if you look at my journals if you read my journals they're pretty utilitarian yeah. in a certain way so this happened this happened this happened this happened i don't put too much of my emotions in my journaling okay it's just i've never kind of journaled that way yeah unless i've gone through a bad breakup or something there you go yeah <laughs> i get that man i get that i, I try to practice journaling I'm, I'm like a once a week type of guy that's good yeah that's definitely more than the average person I'm yeah sure. I, I find yeah. it to be such a useful tool like for example last weekend i caught myself in a moment of just like feeling anger i was actually in a yoga class right? i'm trying to do new shit right so i'm in this yoga class and all of a sudden i'm leaving there and i just feel this anger and I go home. Are you familiar with the emotion wheel? No. Okay. So like in the inside of the emotion wheel are emotions that we believe we're experiencing. For example, anger being one of them. Oh, this is the one that goes outwards. That yes. thing? Yeah, I have seen this. Yes. Okay. Right. So I'm like, well, dude, like what are you actually feeling? Because it's not just anger, right? Like what's underneath it and what's underneath it. So I, dude, I just sat there for an hour and I did that and I was like, whoa, you know, so like just letting it flow through a pen i think it's such like a creative endeavor and there's something about i think writing slows you down yeah it slows you down i also think it's just a great way to order your thoughts yeah you know, when they're just in your head they're kind of like clouds that are constantly shifting and other things come in and move it around but then when you write it out you have to structure it in mm -hmm. some way and it gives you some sort of form to hold on to and i think that for processing your emotions i think that helps a yeah. lot yeah yeah when you were on the walk before you had savannah i'm curious like how did you deal with what was going on between the ears? If there was anything going on between the ears, right? Maybe you could have just been the happiest person in the world, but like, not for nothing, like w walking, like by yourself, I can't even imagine what would come up between my ears. Yeah, that's one of the great benefits of walking is mm -hmm. that you are just with yourself all the time. Yeah. And in the beginning, I think for someone, for anyone who set out on a walk, you know, say they're doing the PCT or a walk across the country, whatever it is, even small walks, but I think especially longer walks when you really give yourself time and space to listen to yourself. I think the probably the worst stuff comes up first or the, the freshest, most painful mm. stuff kind of comes up first. And it's good because you are forced to process it. You can't escape from it. You have time to yourself, thoughts come and go. And eventually you sort of look at it in so many different ways that it resolves itself where you mm -hmm. just go, okay, like I'm bored with this thought. I thought it a, a thousand times already. But before I got Savannah, I was really thinking about this breakup that I had with my long-term girlfriend from uh, college and we, we're a great couple and you know in another life we would have been married probably but we ended things because i was going to do this walk mm. and you know that's not compatible you can't do a you know, five-year what i thought was going to be a five-year walk around the world and being in a relationship wasn't fair to her yeah it wasn't fair to me and so i ended things and i was kind of much more unresolved than i realized mm -hmm. until i started walking and it had been three years since we had broken up 
And when I started walking, I was like, oh, this is not resolved at all. And that kind of happens over and over and over again and more and more granular levels as you go on. And it really took about a year and a half until it felt like I had nothing to think about. I was in the deserts of Peru and I was just like totally empty. I'd thought all the thoughts that I needed to think and I'd felt like the desert. My mm. mind felt like the desert. But yeah, in the beginning, those first four or five months without Savannah, it was first of all just so exciting to be living my dream and walking and then there was the immediate pressure of figuring out what roads to walk where to camp how much food i needed how to stretch so i wasn't sore all these little practical things yeah. of just living out of a cart and walking eight hours a day and then on top of that sort of resolving the maybe the freshest wound or the mm -hmm. most profound wound that i had at the time that's so interesting. So when I hear you say that, right, you said it was three years after that particular breakup and when you were walking, that was what came up. Is it safe to say you believe that time doesn't heal? I mean, I don't know. It's tough to say because I do think time heals. It changes things. Mm -hmm. But I was very surprised at how much I felt once I was out walking. And I think it's very easy especially today to just go through life and cover things up because there's so much stimulation there's so much to do there's so much to occupy yourself that you can easily push things aside yeah and kind of not really realize it either and when you're again when you're out walking you're just with your thoughts mm -hmm. and i think if you did that you'd be very surprised at, at what comes out i was definitely very surprised so i don't know if time you know, it probably does. You know, yeah. you just forget things also. Yeah. So that probably heals it. But I think to really heal it, to really be at peace with it in your philosophy, in your in your heart, in your core, I think you have to, you know, face it head on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of time that can be really painful, you know, for, for some people's trauma, it's probably like drawing poison. It's probably terrible. But yeah. uh, in the long run, I think you could find peace with it yeah you mentioned something else before that i found to be really interesting you said like in another life we could have ended up together or something <laughs> of that sort is it safe to say you believe in more than one lifetime no i think you got this and that's that wash your hands yeah it's all over yeah you don't think your soul goes from who you are today into like another this is like a super metaphysical question <laughs> i'm really not that guy but it, i always find this so like interesting so you don't think your soul will go into another form of some sh some sort to maybe learn a lesson before you reach nirvana or heaven or whatever you call it? That would be amazing. I would love that. Yeah. You know, that'd be fantastic. But no, I mean, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Yeah. And also, I think for me, it's just, you know, part of the, the reason I did the walk is because of that revelation that life is short and it's final and... Uh, death comes at any moment yeah and you know for me that's one of like the driving motivations in life is that mm. this is this is your one chance yeah you said something too in another interview and i'm gonna keep referencing back because i, I mean dude I, i'm like total fanboy like last night this morning just like in preparation right you had mentioned that we're essentially really small and i love that but at the same time it's like we we, me, we can go through life like really thinking we're at the epicenter of it all. What's your advice to someone to shift out of that narrative and, and like zoom out and it's like, hey, like the world doesn't revolve around you. Not everyone cares what you're doing. You know, they're not talking behind your back or whatever it may be. Like, how do we adopt that? I think it's one of the more difficult concepts from my walk that I learned to convey to other people. I'm talking to my best friend about this and I talked to him about it a bunch and it wasn't until maybe the fifth or sixth time mm -hmm. that I wrote about it uh, that he was like, oh, finally click for me, like what you're talking about. And the example I used and I maybe that you were listening to was, I met this guy in the deserts of Peru and he was in this bamboo shack and selling passing motor oil mm -hmm. and uh, selling motor oil and gasoline to passing trucks and it was midday and i just asked him hey can i hang out here in the shade for a while and he was like yeah sure and we were talking and he was so friendly and so generous and clearly very intelligent as well but 
you know, he was born in a small town in the deserts of Peru, and mm -hmm. he was doing his best, and he had to hitchhike to the shack, and then he hitchhiked back, and if no one picked him up, he would hang out there. Otherwise, he'd go back and be with his family. But kind of over and over and over again on this walk, I met people who were definitely kinder than I was, definitely more driven than I was, and more intelligent than I was. Just over and over and over and over, like a million times, you'd meet these great people. And yet I was the one passing through their town and they're speaking Spanish or Arabic or French or whatever it is. And their culture is, they are like clearly a product of their culture mm -hmm. and they're a product of their geography and their history. And you see that over and over again, they realize, oh, you are the same way and everyone's the same way. And it's, we're small. And so it's, and we live day to day. And also it's useful and practical and I think you should have a sense of free will and drive and direction mm -hmm. but on the grander scale of things there are these forces that are just infinitely larger than you that probably have already decided who you are mm -hmm. things like geography things like the economics you're born into the political system you're born into your family history how your family treated you growing up how their family treated them growing up mm -hmm. so there's just like there's so many levels to what creates us. And, and when I was out walking, we saw it so many times. And so for the layman, for someone who's trying to kind of absorb this lesson, I don't know if I have like a practical way to absorb it, because I think it took me a long time to mm -hmm. really truly understand it. But probably the best way is just to travel. And then you see, you know, that there are other places doing things differently, sometimes worse, sometimes better, and people are nice everywhere and people are the same everywhere, but they're eating this food because that's what's local and they're speaking this language because that's what was created there. And mm -hmm. you see that enough times and you realize that, yeah, we are actually very, very tiny. <laughs> why do you think the forces that you allude to, why do you think they gave you the life that you have? Like, why were you geographically born where you were born? Like, why, like, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure, but, you know, I was born in New Jersey in you know, middle class family, but in, you know, one of the wealthiest states and the wealthiest country in yeah. the world in a good school district. And then at 17, my friend Anne-Marie passed. And mm -hmm. if that hadn't happened, you know, in a certain way, I was really fortunate that she died because it woke me to life. And if she hadn't passed away at this formative hour in my life, I would still be you know, doing whatever I was doing, it wouldn't have jolted me awake. And then I saved for years and I went to college because that was a thing to do. And I worked this job putting in solar panels and it paid great and it helped me pay off my loans and I was gonna begin. And then I got a sponsor from a company that, you know, opened up an international branch and they had extra money to sponsor something like this and donate money into Emory's scholarship fund. And on the flip side, I have a friend in Iran who's walked around Iran like seven times and he can't leave because he has an Iranian passport mm. and so those are like some of the small ways that I was you know allowed uh was able to walk around the world because yeah. of you know where I was born it was just a lot of a lot of good fortune yeah. and but you know but then on top of that you know you can consider all these larger factors but also I had a burning desire after Amory died and mm -hmm. for the writing when I was writing after college, I would install solar panels for a few months and then have a few months off. And I would spend eight hours, 10 hours a day in the library. I'd write 5,000 words every day. And I would then do four or five hours of just writing exercises. And I do that all the time over and over and over again. And then, you know, the walking, I was the one that had to walk and there's times it sucked and it was brutal. And you're going through the jungle or over the mountains or through the snow and it's really tough. And so, you know, if you want to live whatever life you want to live, you have to hold yourself accountable. Yeah. But then on the larger scale, also be really nice to yourself mm -hmm. because you're small and you have your limitations just like everyone else does. That is a hard balance. It's a hard balance. <laughs> That's a hard <laughs> yeah, balance. it's a hard balance. This is going to be the most important question I ask you during this whole interview. Grew up in Jersey. Are you growing up in Jersey rooting for Philly teams? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Ooh. Like, come on. The Phillies? 
Yeah, Phillies, okay. Eagles. Well, I, I just want to point out we're, we're Atlanta Braves fans. Okay, on the, on I got show. I got the Phillies hat in my bag right of there. Yeah, I should have wore I should have wore it. I, I heard you reference Steph Curry a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, Why in Steph? The, yeah, in the TED talk. Oh, I think it was the, I mean, because yeah, in the, in the talk. Well, just he's an incredible he's shooter. Great, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. He's so and I, I remember reading this story years ago of uh, how he wore strobe glasses. I know a lot of professional athletes yeah. use that, but he's in the motivational talk. He's a, an easy example that people will understand of using this as you know a constraint, a way to kind of yeah. build that muscle. Yeah, seventy sixers fan too. Yeah, yeah. Tragically, unfortunately, this has been a lot of pain. <laughs> well, he got the Knicks hat on. He. Uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm the weirdest sports fan. I root for the Knicks and the Braves, so it's just like I grew up like 10 minutes from Shea Stadium and City Field, and it was like I'm born in '92. I'm like, Dad, why are you like rooting for the team that's always losing? Yes. You know, so like I became a Braves fan like that. But all right, we we won't talk sports then. Hey everyone, pausing this episode to share something with you in a world of hyper competitiveness. I think the best quote that I can share with you is that there is no one in the world you were than you and that is truer than true, which is exactly why I wanted to share with you today about Brand Builders Group. It's an organization I've been working with over the last few months. It is absolutely incredible and today I am sharing with you the opportunity to hop on a free brand call with a brand strategist to help you break through the wall of obscurity. We are in a hyper competitive space at the moment, whether it be on social or with your podcast or with your blog or with your books or getting on stage. No matter what your endeavor is, this is an opportunity for you to hop on a free strategy call with someone from the team to be able to help you navigate the waters of making sure that you are breaking through the wall and taking advantage of all of the opportunities that you most definitely deserve. Again, there is no one in the world you are than you. So no matter what the problem is that you solve, there might be other people that are out there that also solve the same problem, but there is a strategy that can be placed into your initiatives that will help you break through that wall with speed. So I want to share this with you. It is freebrandcall.com forward slash Matt Labrie. That is going to be in the show notes of this episode, whether you're tuned in from audio or through YouTube, whatever it is, freebrandcall.com forward slash Matt Labrie. You pursue this walk because you knew you valued adventure, but how did you know, or one of the reasons why you pursued it, right? But like, What's your advice for someone to understand what what it is they actually value? Yeah, it's it's a challenge. I think first you have to not think of it as like a flippant question. It's something that you should reflect on over mm-hmm. a while, over five, six months, something like that. And yeah, you know, for me, you said I, I wanted adventure. That was because I knew my weakness or or something that I wasn't something that I wanted to grow out of in high school was that I was really timid and mm-hmm. I was very shy and and reticent and I wanted to grow out of that and so the specifically I wanted to be forced into adventure and so walking was this way mm-hmm. of utilizing a constraint in the sense of when I was walking I would have to pass through every town mm-hmm. you know I would have to, if I even if I was on a bike I could fly by a town and if I was in a car, I could definitely just like go right by town. Mm -hmm. But in part of this desire to see the world, to understand the world, and then on top of that, be forced into adventure, why walking solved all of those was that I would be forced into these places that maybe I would be hesitant to enter in the first place. And Mm -hmm. one of the like best examples of this was in Colombia, where I would get into these towns and I would ask, the older generations say, hey, how's the town ahead? And they would always say, oh, terrible, really dangerous. The FARC is up ahead. It's controlled by paramilitary. You got to be really careful. I would ask a, ge- a younger generation, and they'd be like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, you know, n- no problem. And that's because of La Violencia, La Violencia, which is this 50-year period of political violence and yeah. that went on for a while. So the older generations are really scarred by that. But then I would get through these towns with like this adrenaline. I'd be, oh my gosh, it's going to be so scary. I'm going over the mountains, the, the like over to Popayan uh, and uh, the White City. And really this remote mountain pass and being like, oh my gosh, or am I, I going to run into anyone that's going to yeah. you know, kidnap me or whatever it is. And, and it turned out to be like the most fantastic like four or five day pass ever. And that kind of happened over and over and over again. So, you know, that, that constraint of being forced to grow out of it um, was the benefit of the walk. But for yourself, 
probably the best way to do it is to take action, mm -hmm. is to test yourself against the world. Uh, because there's so many things to do, there's so many things you could be, and you should spend a little time trying things and seeing what fits and seeing what you like and what you don't like. You know, there's only so much time in the day. You only have so much bandwidth. And taking some chances on things too. I mean, like actually taking chances, mm -hmm. like in, in the smallest vein of, you know, asking the girl out that you want to ask out and getting denied or whatever, yeah. you know, and, but putting yourself out there in that way and feeling that rush of taking a chance or of, you know, trying a new sport, of learning to swim, whatever it is, and, and getting that rush of discovering something new. Mm -hmm. I think that sense of discovery and that sense of risk really helps clarify the sense of self as mm -hmm. well because it opens up your possibilities in a way that living in this risk-free train track kind of thing, this path that you're on, it doesn't. Uh, when you take your risks, you you can see yourself in, in different possibilities mm -hmm. in a way that you otherwise wouldn't. So I think take some chances, try some new things, you know, maybe try and start a business, whatever it is, whatever your thing is, I, I think attempt some things. And I think that will help you clarify maybe what you want to be, what you could envision yourself being, and then that hopefully helps inform your values or, you know, one way or the other. Um, and then a lot of it too is probably already just like knowing yourself mm -hmm. and that's, you know, very amorphous, difficult concept, but, you know, that's maybe therapy, that's maybe uh, journaling, that's talking to your family, talking to your friends, um, and, you know, just spending time with yourself. And, you know, it's... It's a difficult thing, and I think it's probably ever-changing as well. It's not like you will value the same things at 21 that you value at 31. Sure, yeah. You know, it's, it's a constantly changing thing. But knowing what you value, I think, is probably the most critical and under-realized foundation to success mm -hmm. and to happiness, honestly, because it informs everything you do. Mm -hmm. And if you find something that you're passionate about, ultimately, it allows you to, you know, be consistent in your action. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to embrace, you know, the constraints that I talked about, like walking, because you know what you value. I mean, marriage is a great example of this, where, you know, in a certain way, marriage is a constraint. Mm. You choose to live your life with one person. You know, but the benefits of marriage are well observed, they're well documented, married people live longer, happier, healthier lives. Yeah. At its best, you get to spend your life with someone who loves you, even though you're a messed up human like everyone else, and that's an incredible thing, and you get to love them as well for all their faults. But you're able to do that because you know the value, you know what you value. You're, you're mm. focusing rather than what is being prevent, what you are being prevented from doing and rather instead like that more subtle growth that you're experiencing, that, you're, that journey that you're going through. And it comes from knowing what you value. You value that person and then you're able to choose a life and then walk that life. Yeah. So that's when you're thinking about, you know, what you value, it's really just about what life do you want to live? Yeah. And what life are you okay with living and sacrificing the other lives mm -hmm. to live. Yeah, I think values are, they're like a guiding compass to an extent, right? They, I mean, especially from like a relationship perspective, right? If you're not aligned in your values, that is, to me at least, like the true sense of incompatibility, right? To an extent, right? If they're non-negotiables or whatever it may be. Um, many questions from what you just shared though. First on happiness. What is happiness to you? Outside of it being an emotion, is it a state? Is it something that can be defined? Yeah, I mean, I think happiness is probably, uh, you know, walking around the world with your dog. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's probably as high as it gets. Uh, today, we probably under-realize our humanity mm -hmm. a little too much in the sense of we, we're not outside enough, we don't get enough nature, we probably don't spend enough time with friends and family, we work too much. And, you know, when I was out walking, happiness was just derived from I'm getting exercise, I'm outside, mm -hmm. I'm discovering new things, I'm meeting new people. At night, you know, I'm sleeping in a tent, 
but it's under the stars and I have, mm-hmm. you know, my dog beside me and I have this little bit of security. And so, you know, in a in that vein, you know, that's probably happiness, but I think a lot of it is, you know, again, knowing what you value and then being okay with your direction in life and having some small purpose to drive you forward and, mm-hmm. and feel like, okay, I have some structure to my days. I have some people who love me. I'm honest. I am, am not contradicting myself in too many ways. Of course, you'll contradict yourself, but I think that uh, I think that's probably as close as you can get. I love that. In regards to going out there and trying things, right, and like putting yourself out there in for for the sake of identifying values and whatnot do you feel like it actually hurts us to have the amount of options we have here in america versus let's say you know a third world country that you might have passed through or or something of the sort where it's like hey you know you can't get up and hop into a podcast studio and become a podcaster so do options hurt us it's difficult i wouldn't i wouldn't say that they hurt us necessarily and if they do it's more subtle than mm-hmm. than we realize i would say because it's it, it it's something i talk about again in my talk but it's this it's the paralysis of choice mm-hmm. which is this like well-known psychological phenomenon the more choices you have the less satisfied you are with your decision if there's a wall of 50 different ketchups whatever ketchup you buy you will be less happy with if there was only three ketchups up there yeah. you, you'd be happier with that decision and so that's the same thing and but I, that paralysis that you get is really subtle and in a certain way it's really tragic because you're always second guessing it's that second guessing which is mm-hmm. what holds you back is oh well, i could have done this and i could have done this and and life is easier and it's simpler if you can commit yourself to just one path mm. and and walk that one path and i think you'll be happier as well because then you know when uh, you know someone says hey do you want to do this you can say no i don't want to do that i don't like that thing that's not the path i want to walk and and be fine with it and then it also allows you when you're not second guessing it allows you to ride out hardships mm. you know the the walk again as the example is pushing over the mountains, you know, eating rice and beans and pasta every day for years on end and being tired that and sweaty to me. and sore. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of peanut butter jellies. And, you know, you those things end up not feeling like obstacles or challenges yeah. at all because, you know, you are happy living this one path that you're yeah. that you're on so again it all it all it all comes back together it all fits together are you the type of guy that says to your lady where do you want to go to eat or do you say hey do you want to go to mcdonald's or burger king like, <laughs> i should just say do you want to go to mcdonald's or burger king that's I the don't. better way to go that's yeah it, right? i gotta start i so i gotta start implementing that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what i heard as you were sharing that it's like ah see that that's where I, you know uh, that famous social media clip that goes around it's like give two options don't give too many right because that really is such good practical application of it. i mean yeah. it, I'm, i can speak from experience i believe the amount of options that we have leads leads to inaction exactly yeah you know and it's just like it's it's like just freaking go do it but like you said the second guessing or the rumination on whatever it may be that i feel like that's what's plaguing so many of us in in at least in this country, yeah. right? And then furthermore, forget about this country, but then you go to a big city like Philly, you go to a big city like New York. I think I even heard you say something along the lines of a, st- a statistic about why people in New York are actually single longer than, you know, a rural area. Was that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, who knows actually if that's the exact yeah. sure There's a bunch of factors into it, but... You know, in theory, it's one if you've dated in New York. Yeah. There's always another option. You can always so, date someone else. It's Yeah. That's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned something about knowing yourself before. And as I was watching an interview earlier, you had shared that you thought you knew more about yourself when you started the walk than you actually did. Uh, than you actually did when you were on the walk. You were like, wow, like I, I thought I had this awareness of self until I started walking and then the awareness like really like revved up. What can someone do in New York or Philly or wherever they are that might not have the opportunity to walk around the world for five, six, seven years to be able to learn about themselves on that level or at least start 
the inward journey. Yeah, I think meditation is meditation. great. I'm sure you get that recommendation all the time um, from people on on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Walking, I think you go for you know. I really believe like walking is this like, fundamental evolutionary thing. Which this is not something I believed probably before the walk, yeah. and it wasn't until I did the walk that I s saw these very subtle benefits. And and now I'm very aware of them. But when I first started. I was not at all. And mm -hmm. now I can kind of see how the mind starts working when you're walking. But yeah, you're moving, you let your mind run free, and you start, you know, reflecting on yourself. And I think it's just that reflection. You need mm -hmm. to give yourself some space, you know, whether it's meditation, maybe yoga. I think yoga maybe is even wouldn't be as effective as uh, walking, yeah. I think, because it's still a little almost a little too active mm -hmm. and you really just need to give yourself, you know, some better to be like sitting in a field without mm -hmm. your cell phone kind of thing and, and do nothing. I think it's more just like this benefit of, of doing nothing and allowing your mind to sort of untether for a little bit and let the thoughts come and go. And once you let that happen, then you start to see yourself clear in a way that again, when you're constantly distracting yourself and yeah. there's always these distractions, you just can't, you just can't. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like, and I know you alluded to one point earlier in regards to like the three year breakup, like coming back up when you started a walk, but what do you feel like you weren't aware of that you became aware of on the walk? I would say like just how much of an idiot I was. Why do you say that? <laughs> like, just was, you know, uh, and you know, I went to college and, you know, I grew up well-meaning and, yeah. you know, kind, but you just, I just knew nothing of the world. And when you know nothing of the world, you, you're you just an idiot. And you, I think, make <laughs> assumptions that you shouldn't make. And you're more brash than you should be. And you're more confident than you should be. Mm. And you just see, you know, just how kind of like ordinary everything is out there. And how ordinary you are. Mm. And, uh, and so that, I think that kind of levels everything. And, you know, when you're younger you have more of these like things that you are really really like uh, certain about yeah and then you get out there and you go mm, i don't know about that that's interesting because i believe one of the other intentions you had shared was that you know for doing this walk like you wanted to understand the world what about the world did you want to understand i wasn't sure i mean i you know i set out with there's you know that the walking fulfilled those three values that i had those three primary things that i wanted out of my life and I really began the walk with the intention of trying to have no preconceived notions mm -hmm. and just letting the world come to me, you know, because, you know, whatever you look for, you're going to find kind of thing. And so, yeah, it was when I when I started, I tried to just let it come to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, I've been actually dabbling with the idea of the 12 hour walk. Are you familiar with the concept? No. I don't know who started it, but I mean, you've clearly have done it, but essentially the 12 hour walk is a completely techless day. Let's say you walk out of your house at 7 a.m. You don't come back till 7 p.m. You do it alone. You do it without tech. You do it like just a nonstop walk. Of course, take a break to eat, whatever. They give you some recommendations, like have three liters of water with you and like have a couple snacks or whatever the case may be. So you bury with liter and a half. <laughs> what, whatever it is I by with. yeah like yeah. What, whatever you need you know i've been i've really been toying with that idea and in full transparency like just even thinking about committing to that is uncomfortable like it, it's slightly anxiety producing it's like fuck because i'm one that if i do something i can't not achieve it like yeah. I, I have to achieve it um but it's uncomfortable to even think like going that long without tech, walking around and kind of just like being aimless about it. Like, did you ever have moments on your journey where it was like, this is really fucking uncomfortable. I might turn back or anything of that sort. I mean, yeah, you get into some sketchy areas for yeah. sure. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I like that. I like the idea of the 12 hour walk. I think, yeah. it'd, be, I think it'd be very valuable. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's that, it's that sacrifice. Yeah. It's, you know, do you want to spend the day unconnected, mm. untethered, not being quote unquote productive. Yeah. But I, I do think if you did that a few times, you would see the benefit of it. And Absolutely. the first time you probably wouldn't, or mm -hmm. you'd be looking for the benefit and that would not be the benefit. Mm -hmm. And what I'm like, I think what I, you know, there's this idea too, I think, especially in New York, you know, where everything has to be 
neatly boxed and marketed <laughs> and you have to extract value from every little place that mm-hmm. you are and every moment of your life and walking is not like that you know and and that that getting to know yourself isn't like that and you can't kind of put it on this timeline yeah. and you know if you're doing these 12 hour walks I think the first time you do it, especially the first few times you do it, you're going to want to tell your friends about it and say, hey, oh, man, this was incredible. Oh, man, I had this thought when I was out there and oh, it was great. I got to sit in this park and whatever else. That's not the benefit. The benefit, you haven't even realized the benefit yet. It's going to take you 20 walks yeah. to start really dredging up what you need to dredge up and really bringing about that piece. Mm. And so I think there would be great value in it. Uh, but also, I think almost looking for the value ruins it that's such a good point so it's like or so let me just make sure i'm comprehending this it's like don't set out with the intention of like give me value exactly yeah so what do you set your intention on for something like that do you nothing think? you just go out go out just, into the world just yeah. go out into the world and out with yourself mm. and it'll be different than what you've done and that's the value is that you are out there living and you're listening to yourself and you're seeing shops that you wouldn't have seen and Mm. maybe meeting people that you wouldn't have and you're just letting the world come to you and you know whatever happens happens and that's yeah benefit do you think if you are quote-unquote intentionless in an endeavor like that it allows you to be more present yeah i would say so yeah for sure yeah right It's, it's that you know like, like I said uh, a moment ago, is that it, when you look for something, you find it. Yeah. You know? And exactly. So you kind of a- automatically filter out mm-hmm. everything else. When you were in those areas that were, quote unquote, troublesome or whatever, I know that there was one particular moment where I believe you actually had like a knife up against your chest at one point. The neck, yeah. Oh, it was the neck. Mm-hmm. Did you ever feel like you were divinely guided or like protected? No, I'd say the closest to god that uh i've experienced is savannah for sure yeah yeah otherwise no um no, i mean look i'm that's you're small i'm a human like anyone else i am just a tourist i was just an american in panama or wherever i was people get robbed there people die all the time people get bacterial infections <laughs> why should i be an exception yeah, yeah yeah i mean i just think about it though you, are you comfortable talking about savannah oh yeah sure yeah, yeah. like for example, when you were in, you know, you got picked up with Savannah and, you know, you could tell the whole story about like when the blood was coming out of her nose and like you tried calming her heart rate and all of that stuff. But like to think that a car was passing when you were, I think you said like 60 miles away from like anything at that point. Mm-hmm. Like to me, that's like you had someone like playing with the the strings a little bit there. Maybe. I mean, I was on the road. I wasn't totally out in the desert. Okay. The road was built by someone. You know, it's a system for right. cars to go. That's more how I probably see things. But no, it was very, you know, I waited, I don't know, maybe, maybe only 20 minutes, something like that. And yeah, I mean, it was incredibly, incredibly fortunate. Yeah. Um, and we were able to get to a little town and get her uh, a sedative and then get a taxi to a city and get her to the vet the you know two days later but no i mean i didn't didn't really see it as divine yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. i get that what was the difference between the i believe i mean you were with savannah longer than you were by yourself on the trip is that correct yeah yeah i was by myself for four months or a little over four months what was the difference between that four months when you were alone versus the bulk of time that you were with her yeah when i was alone it's just it was so new Mm -hmm. and it really felt more like treading water Mm -hmm. in the beginning and then even that first year even after i got savannah when i got into central america you know i would say like the first four or five months was figuring out the basics of living on the road Mm -hmm. and then i adopted savannah who was a puppy we entered mexico walked down to panama and then going through central america was that was my first time walking abroad and you know everything is overwhelming and i'm learning a new language and i'm learning new cultures and i'm passing through these cities that i don't quite understand and i have a puppy you know dog walking (laughs) beside me so the first year, I really did not have time to really process much. I was just thrown into the deep end and and treading water, surviving. <laughs> but, you know, Savannah, ultimately, once I had time to, you know, process things and relax, and really wasn't until the deserts of Peru and Chile where I, you know, I had time to do that. She was like, 
you know, I realized how amazing she was and what a beast she was and how she just always wanted to see what was ahead. And, you know, she, she couldn't express herself, obviously. And, you know, I'm sure she was sore and had stomach aches and was tired and sometimes just wanted to do nothing. But every day she's like hyped to get on the road and keep yeah. going and was always a trooper. And, you know, and then she was perfectly adapted to the road and, you know, ultimately it became this shared journey, mm -hmm. you know, and she was this incredible companion where whatever I wanted to do, she was ready to do. If I wanted, if we needed to walk 36 miles that day, she would walk 36 miles. If we got to a hotel and it was like, I'm sore, she would just lay on bed, lay in bed all day and mm -hmm. she'd be totally fine with that. So yeah, ultimately it was just that it was, you know, this great shared journey and, you know, she's the first dog to walk around the world. So by proxy, I'm the first person to walk around the world with a, with dog. a dog. And which is an incredible, like, I just feel in a certain way so honored to have shared that with her and to have this incredibly unique experience. You know, we spent every minute of every day together and we went through so many difficulties and challenges and you know, she's the only one, she's the only on, other one who knows in a certain yeah. way, like what we did. And uh, so, yeah, it was just, I was just really glad to, to have had her by my side. Yeah. So how can you feel small knowing you're the first person ever to walk around the world with a dog? Because that'll be forgotten. I'll be forgotten. And then the people who remembered me will be forgotten. And, mm. you know, it's all... It'll all be washed over. Even in the the world of the internet, you think you're going to be forgotten? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. I mean, sure. your TED talk has over a million views. No, that can't be right. <laughs> if it I'm, does, that's crazy. I'm pretty sure your TED talk has over a million views. That, can we fact check that? That can't be right. <laughs> but, and what if it is right? <laughs> who cares? So who, who okay, cares? that that's valid. That's valid. Yeah. Um, by the way, I mean, walking around the world is one thing. Doing it with like with a puppy is essentially like raising a baby. I, I mean, I raised my dog. I also have an Australian cattle. Oh, nice. Um, right. And just like, dude, I was so stressed raising him at home. Yeah. I could only imagine on the road. We're thinking of like, my girlfriend and I are thinking of getting another dog. Yeah. And the training is the thing I'm like looking forward to least. I actually think walking was the greatest training because you're with them all the time. Yeah. And you had, they have the structure and you have them on leash. I was when they were puppy, when she was older, we could have, she could have walked off leash on any road for eight hours a day. Would have just that, had yeah. her ear brushing my calf. But I thought it was the great, the greatest training ever. And I'm like, if I get a new dog, I'm just going to walk the AT. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that'll be the training. <laughs> Well, that's great, man. I mean, just like the fact that it happened that way. Like, I, I, I mean, I was only doing like one hour of training a day. Like, we we don't have the best heel or things like that. But I that's can only, good. You got to do something. You got to train. You know. I mean, in yeah. New York, dude, it's just like yeah. crossing a street. Like, especially you know it on Australian cattle, they got freaking energy. Like, yeah. they're ready to go. They are very like task oriented dogs. Like they need something to do, whether it's fetch or whatever the case is. But yeah, you need a heel. Yeah, you, you need a heel in New York. Yeah, you know? it's for like, sure. Dude, that is a useful there. command. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why did you feel like Savannah was the closest you were to God? I think because it's that that idea of like I got to she existed you know she passed a couple months ago yeah. uh kidney failure and i existed i got to like share her life with her and she lived this incredible life and she also just like when i was out there i would just like marvel out like what a what a beast she was and it was really difficult you know we would go through like very difficult terrain the first couple of years in particular were just attacked by strays constantly. Mm. Uh, but she was always nice and curious and, you know, dogs are just like the greatest animals ever. Mm. They're, they're like eternal optimists yeah. and, uh, you know, they hold no ill will or they don't want to at least. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just like looking at, at my life, I just think, wow, I can't believe I got the, I got to walk around the world with Savannah. Yeah. yeah. That is really cool. Did you yeah. grow up with dogs? 
Yeah, we had a dog scout. Yeah, terrier. Yeah. My dad's dog. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's so, so awesome. Yeah, that was that was part of it. Why I know it's like okay, I was exposed to it, and yeah, uh, my dad had him well trained, and so yeah, we. I, I think it's different too when you have your first dog. Like Big Savannah time. was your dog. Yeah. Right, like that is a huge like difference. Bec- I, I mean, I grew up with a Belgian Shepherd named Sheba. That was my dad's dog. Yeah, like Sheba loved me. I mean, let's just say she was like three or four when I was born, or something of the sort. Like, she protected me, but like that wasn't my dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, your dog. They are they're your dog. Th- yeah, they want to be with you, and they and know they listen it. to you. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I, like that is a huge differentiating factor. Like they know who's putting the bowl down to feed them, or like who, like whatever the case may be. Yeah. Like huge difference. Huge difference, and they like take on your personality too. You know? Absolutely, they're picking up on everything you do, which is a little scary to be <laughs> honest. It's like <laughs> yeah. you got four legs, and like you're you're me. Yeah, yeah. Would, did anyone ever tell you like Savannah looks like you or something of the sort? No, not looks like me, but she was definitely calm in i think like a similar way just from from the walking i yeah. would say yeah you had, are very stoic yeah i suppose <laughs> you are no like you are you're you have like a, a very stoic sense by the way rachel do is it a million on the ted talk I can find it. you can't find i'll find it yeah uh, i'm pretty positive it is yeah i doubt it <laughs> but maybe <laughs> i'm gonna look it up in a yeah, second yeah. but um yeah like you have like this stoic sense to you like mm-hmm. it's almost it's almost as if the external holds no weight. I say less so, yeah. And that's again, that's that a lot of that's from the walking. And I think when I began, it wasn't so much like that. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of the the first, I'd say, year and a half or so was I was driven by that internal burning desire to prove myself mm-hmm. and to prove to the world that I could do this thing. And then eventually that kind of falls by the wayside once you realize, oh, okay, I have done, I, I am doing this thing and I mm-hmm. am capable of doing this thing. And also I had this experience of, you, know, you always think there's something more out there and that you can become something more that you can, you can move beyond your humanity and become, you know, in like, the name of capitalism mm-hmm. or uh, efficiency become like you know, this perfect automon- automaton of efficiency and, mm-hmm. and money making and and renown and success or or in spirituality thinking that you can become some sort of Buddha or you know some mm-hmm. some some enlightened individual, but maybe four or five somewhere beyond the halfway point. I think I was probably in Turkey where I had been out there long enough and realized. Oh no, like you walked all these miles, you met all these people, you spent all this time with yourself and you're just you. Mm. And part of that is like the change is so gradual that you start losing the sense of how you've changed. And in the beginning, you have these really dramatic changes and you really feel how the world is changing you and how all this time you spend with yourself is changing you. And then it becomes more subtle. But you get to a point when you realize, oh, you're just you're just human, and that's all you're ever going to be. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what you strive to be. You're still going to age. You're still going to have your faults. You're mm-hmm. still going to have your emotions. You're still going to have your wants. And maybe that's like some form of enlightenment. Yeah, I, that leads me to ask you, like, what did the walk do for you to help let go of control? Yeah, it's it's that it's that idea of being small. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's again that. It's just spending so much time with yourself that you know you see how you were influenced and then just really like learning to be at peace with who you are and what faults you have and and how much you know effectiveness you can have in your own life mm-hmm. and and again I, I think it's valuable to like want something and to be driven towards things i think it's good to have structure in your day and but i think it's also important to you know spend time with your friends family and be outside or whatever it is uh but also to just to know that you know it, it's useful to know your limitations in a way because then when you're working towards something you can just take each day as it is mm-hmm. which is what like one of these things i learned from savannah was that she would walk every day and didn't matter how she was feeling internally, she would mm-hmm. do what she needed to do, set the day aside, go on to the next day. And with the walking, it was the same thing for me, where there would be four days in a row where it would just be, I wouldn't meet anyone, and it would be super boring, 
or I'd be miserable just because I was miserable and I just kept waking up on the wrong side of the bed, the air mattress, <laughs> the, the inflatable sleeping pad. And then for two weeks in a row, I'd meet a bunch of incredible people. I'd have incredible food and I'd be on cloud nine and the weather it would be 65 degrees and it would yeah. be perfect and, and all that. And you kind of realize there's like this, there's each day is not like this absolute thing. And mm. so when you're really striving towards something, you can put in your six, eight hours, whatever it is, and be okay with that. And then you wash your hands and you go, okay, hopefully I you know, improved that 1%. I made this a little bit better. Then you do it again the next day and you go, okay, do it again. Mm. But everything feels, every like singular thing feels less important, mm. you know, because it's taken as a whole rather than, oh, this is the most dire interview. I think a lot of times a day in this drive to succeed, especially in something like, podcasting or in you know if you're writing or, or television you think you're going to have this one big moment where you're going to break through mm -hmm. and this is the interview that's going to propel me to the next level and then i'm going to be on easy street and really it's not that it's the six years that you've been podcasting and it's a slow gradual build up of things and and that's with everything it's not like you you know you you just find you know the diamond in the rough and then life's over even when if you do find it life goes on and you still have to keep doing things yeah. and so you just learn to take it like step by step i love that yeah. what has your grieving process of savannah been like if you don't mind me asking that yeah uh i would say initially i felt a lot of guilt um because maybe she died of limes maybe she had limes disease uh or lime i guess and uh, maybe not i don't know but you know, that f for me felt like something preventable, even though it probably wasn't, she was always on stuff, but we had to use off brand, you know, collars and, you know, tick protection, whatever. But I really, what I think that probably stemmed from that guilt is that I was just her protector mm. forever. And through like, again, a lot of difficult places and a lot of aggressive dogs and people who didn't want a dog around and, you know, a lot of these hotels, I, I made this pact with myself that I would always sleep where she sleeps. And so we get to these hotels and I'd be really tired and they would say, no, you know, we're not taking a dog. And you go, okay, then we have to walk another two miles or whatever to this yeah. hotel or, or we're camping in an in, in ideal place. Uh, so it was just like I was in this protection mode of her forever, defending her from, you know, the vagaries of the world. And so I think that was a lot of it. So probably for a month, it was a lot of guilt and you know wishing i had done better and now it's more just like i miss her yeah yeah well she still lives on through you man yeah i mean it's documented in so many ways like she she's a part of your story forever oh for sure yeah for sure yeah it's just you know for me it's just like oh, i miss you know miss hanging out with her i love hanging out with her of course. Yeah, but I mean, she definitely you know is you know as immortalized as you can be hopefully yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's your baby, right? That's Definitely. your baby. Yep. I was watching something of yours this morning, and I, I had my little guy right next to me, and I'm like, you know, I I, I actually, are you familiar with uh, Dan Millman? He, yeah. he uh, a movie was based on it. I've had him on the show numerous times, a movie called The Peaceful Warrior. And he actually says that we should be meditating on death more often than we, than we do, because it's inevitable. Mm. And that's actually something I do with my dog because I know that that yeah. day is to come. You yeah, know, like I appreciate it. Yeah, man, it really does. I mean, knock on wood, like he's turning four, but it's like, you know, yeah. whether it's tomorrow or in 10 years, like it's inevitable, yeah. you know? And it's like, if you meditate on it now, it's not to say that it makes it easier. You know, it's just like, Oh, makes you shit. cherish this yeah, exactly yeah you know and I totally I, agree when i was watching one of your videos i just looked over at him and he was just like sprawled out like this <laughs> and i'm like i'm here bro um but yeah man I, I appreciate you sharing that because that. it's something that i fear and just like hearing you say like the guilt aspect and just like hey like i you know i wish you was still here like yeah. it, it it's it's tough i, I don't even want to get emotional because yeah. anytime i watch like a movie with a dog or something like i'm in full-blown tears uh, yeah. i couldn't watch anything right now yeah, understood <laughs> yeah understood <laughs> yeah. man understood what is a question you wished more people would ask you whether it be about the walk or about yourself or oh I, man i don't know um i think that that concept of the smallness is one that i 
enjoy talking about. Yeah. Uh, and that I think, uh, you know, like having a, a little space to talk about because it's just such a difficult and kind of unrealized like subject yeah uh but no i'm not sure I, yeah i don't know i love that yeah well you got the new book coming out walk seven years the world walk the world walk the world walk, the world walk. Yeah. seven years twenty-eight thousand miles six continents a grand meditation one step at a time yeah this is going to be linked in the show notes for everyone that's watching this but i want to know when someone picks up the book if they could only take one thing away from it what do you want the one thing to be and why just an enjoyable read a great adventure yeah mm -hmm. i would say that was the primary focus and you know there's when i'm going through my journals there's so many and my memories there's like so many details there's yeah. so many interesting things that i want to share and i want to convey and in service of the reader you just can't Mm. You have to, same thing with a photograph, you can't, the photograph doesn't actually show the world. The book won't convey the world walk. It won't convey what Savannah and I went through. So the goal was just to give the best idea, the best sense of my growth mm. and what it's, what the experience of walking around the world is like in as an entertaining and enjoyable read as possible. Yeah. So I hope they just enjoy the book and, and have a good adventure. Beyond that, though, yeah. what's what's the big payoff that you want someone to take away? Well, if you get to the end, the the payoff is, you know, death is inevitable, but but life is here now, and so you just gotta live now. Live now, you know. Yeah. Ultimately, that's it. I love that, man. Mm -hmm. If I knew what Tom knows, how would my life be different? Uh, you probably work less hard. <laughs> I would work less hard. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. That, yeah. I've that's gotten valid. very lazy. In a certain way, I've gotten very lazy. Um, no, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, well, I, why do you work less hard? Well, I, I mean, I think part of it is that, uh, you know, I had this really, really clear driving motivation for such a long time and then i had the book which was this really clear driving motivation and so i'm i'm, I'm speaking within the moment of where i am now yeah, where yeah. it's like I, these big things that i was aiming towards are completed mm -hmm. and now i have to find the next thing so i also just don't have you know as clear of a direction right now which is i actually do work very hard <laughs> when i was working. gonna say you just said you, I, you've been writing work, for eight hours a day i do work very hard but it takes it it's, it takes a while for me to find the thing um Actually, no, okay, okay, so, yeah, contradict myself, <laughs> but I would, uh, you would walk more, for sure, you would definitely walk more, you yeah. would almost never be in a car, you yeah. would use public transportation, um, yeah, I would say one of the main things, too, is, um, you know, just going out, and, and, and New York's great for this, uh, but, you know, you see the world, and you see all, how all these other places are designed, mm -hmm. and America is just so wildly car-centric, Yeah, and it pays a lot of, um, cost there's mm -hmm. a lot of externalities to, towards car ownership and the world is just more enjoyable when people are out biking and walking and personally it's just more enjoyable especially when you can do it safely and you know not be blasted by an f-150 yeah coming around the corner uh so i'd say actually that was probably in your day-to-day -day, that's i don't know you, you live in new york so you're probably walking I walk train all the time, time. so yeah, yeah. yeah not much would change yeah I, i'm i'm the type of guy that's like oh yeah we could walk it and it's like 17 miles away yeah you know like that that's that's what i embody but um i actually discovered how much i loved walking um in 2016 uh, I just started, I was fresh out of college. I started working with one of the sharks from Shark Tank and I just never had an office job. Like I was an intern before and I just felt so overwhelmed. I ended up like going into a full blown panic. I walked home from Times Square into, into Queens, but like that walk drastically calmed me down. Yeah. You know, it was like a 20 plus mile walk or like throughout the whole day, you know, like I had my Apple watch on and then I realized I'm like, you know, I got home, I felt better. But I'm like, no, 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 like, it's not done yet. Like, I went to my local park, and I walked around the park a whole bunch of times. You had a lot to work through. <laughs> I, yeah, man. Yeah. But it, it was, like, so, so game-changing in so many ways. And then after that, I was just like, I'm going to walk there. I'm going to yeah. walk here. You know, like, I don't have a car right now, actually. So, like, I, I either walk or I, I do bike. Um but yeah, walking is an absolute game changer. Yeah, especially in New York, it's so great. Yeah. Like, there's so much going on, and you know, yeah. there's always something to, to occupy you. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'm curious, so like, what is next for you? 
right? Like you were saying, like, I got to figure it out, you know, but earlier in this episode, you were like, just, you know, do something. Yeah. So like, what is that something for you? Right now, I mean, I started doing CrossFit and I'm playing yeah. pickleball and I'm reading different books. Uh, so I'm just feeling it out right now. Um, you know, I'm living in Kentucky. My girlfriend's doing a residency there at UC. Uh, so we're there for a couple of years. Uh, but really, yeah, just just figuring it out. I love you know, that. I, it's, uh, uh, it's to be determined. TBD, yeah. TBD. Yeah. How often are you playing pickleball? Uh, probably like three times a week, maybe four times a week. Are you trying week, to go depending. pro or is it just like, uh, it's just, it's, there's like 36 courts right across the river where like I just can ride across this pedestrian bridge and then there's 36 courts. There's always people there. So it's like, whenever I get bored, I can go over there and yeah. play with some people. So it's just like the kind of the social aspect of it. Okay. And, so it's leisure right do. now. Oh yeah. I don't take okay. it. Yeah. I mean, it's like wiffle ball. You can't take it too seriously. You know? I mean, I took wiffle ball very seriously. <laughs> yeah, all right, there you go. Yeah. I went so you can hard. if you want. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, like I have friends who like, they could look on an app and it could tell them like their pickleball ranking. Oh yeah. Yeah. My friends have that. I don't have that. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know the I proper think, term. It's like 4.0, 4. Yeah. 4.5, 4. like whatever, whatever the, yeah. the scale is. Yeah, so that would be that would level. be really satisfying though to see to, to like work on that score. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent, man. I Maybe mean, pickleball... that'll be the next thing. Turn pro in pickleball. I listen, <laughs> man. I mean, I watch it on ESPN sometimes. Yeah. Like if I'm just like, all right, you know, I'm chilling tonight or whatever it is. Like I get hit with it all the time on TikTok. Like some of them are freaking awesome. Oh yeah, like yeah. they're so good. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, I love that. What have you been reading? You so said that you've been reading. Yeah, um, I just read some Paul Theroux, um, okay. Dark Star Safari, which is great. Uh, he's just, an, you know, the travel writer for years and years and years. He writes very differently than I do. Yeah. Uh, much more, uh, like, factual and historical, and he includes all these details that I would never include. Yeah. Uh, but it's great. It's great writing, and it really gives you a sense of place. And then I'm reading some writing books, always kind of reading some writing books, and uh, some public speaking books here and there, triple yeah. eight those. Read The Economist, uh, which is something I got into later in my walk as I was trying to understand the world a little more. So I read The Economist every week. It's like with my morning coffee, I read that. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I'm going through right now. Would yeah. you ever walk the world again? No, no way. Never well, maybe again. when I'm like 60. It's tough, man. Oh, <laughs> I'm tough. sure it is. It's yeah, tough. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, by the end, I remember thinking, like, when I was going over the Ben Franklin, I had this cart, and I was like, man, I would love to fling this cart into the Delaware River and never <laughs> see it again. I was sick of pushing this thing. But, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's the greatest life, and it was fantastic, and every day was so packed with yeah. newness and discovery and challenge. But... <clears throat> It's also really nice to, you know, have the morning coffee Chill, and uh, a yeah, hot shower. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a long time, too, where I really, really wanted to, like, work on my writing. That's what I did before the walk. And when I was out walking, you just couldn't. I just, I didn't have a desk. I mm -hmm. would try and sit on my inflatable pad and work. And just, like, my back's hurting. And so, all right, mm -hmm. just do these little stories. And then I got into photography. So, also, there's that. I really was, by the end, I was really ready to to sit down at my desk and work yeah. 10 hours a day on on the book kind of thing so who knows maybe in seven years it'll you know i'll get sick of the sedentary life and i hear that get out well, there. even if it's just across the country right i think mike posner did that or yeah. you know a couple people have done that which is pretty cool oh, yeah. too so well listen man i'm cheering you on regardless of what you do like I, i'm super super grateful for this moment and just being able to amplify this share of the book and all of that good stuff i do have one last question for you uh slightly contradictory to what you believe to an extent i usually always ask the last question of if you live to whatever year you want to live to you write as many books you hop on as many podcasts you visit as many countries you walk the world again whatever it is you want to do but you could only be remembered for one piece of advice Mm. Hence why I'm saying it's contradictory because you're telling me that mm. we're we're all small and yeah, all of I, that. No, it's it's a valuable question. Yeah. Right. So like not necessarily how you want to be remembered, but more so if I think of Tom, what is the advice that will always live on because I'm thinking of him? Mm. Yeah. Man, I think early on it would have been, you know, something along the lines of like Carpe diem, that's what it was in the beginning. Uh but I think after the years of walking and and you know seeing the world it's just that if you pay attention if you just living your life is enough like you are already 
enough as is. You know, you don't have to put this insurmountable pressure on yourself to be something exceptional or something beyond human. Just living your life and existing and reading interesting things and meeting interesting people. And even if it's not that, even if you have, you're being beaten down by geography or, you know, your local politics or, you know, whatever it is, just to live your life mm. is incredible. And if you can just observe your life, you're doing a great job. That's beautiful. That's a mic drop moment right there, man. <laughs> that is so good. All right, everyone, on that note, just putting it out there, Tom's new book, socials, websites, all of that good stuff is in the show notes. Should we put anything else in the show notes? Do you have anything else going on that we should make people aware of? No, that's it. Yeah. Okay, new book, socials, websites, all of that good stuff will be in the show notes. Tom, thank you so much again, man. This is an absolute pleasure. Super, super grateful for the opportunity to just chop it up with you, man. Like it super fun yeah it was super, fun enjoyed it good fun. questions appreciate i appreciate it. you man yeah. for everyone that's tuned into this again you can check tom out in the show notes of this episode make sure that you are clicking the link to check out the new book on top of that i want to put it back on your mind from earlier in this episode way way earlier right over an hour ago i mentioned that you were here for a reason i'm also going to put it out there that that reason may be to make sure that someone else in your life is aware of this episode. So whether you click that share button, you drop it in a group text or directly to someone or you share it on social or whatever the case is, you have the ability to be the beacon of light in someone else's life from all of the amazing wisdom, experiences, knowledge, all of that good stuff that Tom dropped here on this episode. So I'm putting that on your heart and on your mind. Until next time, everyone, be blessed. Peace.